So, good evening everyone, you're very welcome to the Black Box. On behalf of the Galway Science and Technology Festival um, Committee, my colleagues here tonight, Don Leach and Jerry Woods, I welcome you all here tonight. My name is Anne Murray and I work with the festival. Um, we're delighted to welcome you to the Science of Sweet Sea Swimming, sponsored by Creative Ireland and Galway City Council. So firstly, if you'd all please um, continue to wear your masks throughout the night. And also, when you're leaving, give yourself plenty of room and um, adhere to the social distancing guidelines when you're leaving at the end. So, back to the science. Science is all around us. It's not just contained in laboratories, white coats and chemicals. Science is defined as the systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation and experiment. And tonight we focus on astronomy, behavioral science, engineering, and maybe some physics. The Galway Science and Technology Festival was set up in 1998 to encourage students to study the STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, and maths. As Ireland's growing medtech and digital technology hub, we're gaining global recognition as a place for research, development, and innovation. The companies in this space located here in Ireland created a big demand for STEM graduates. The 2021 Goi Science and Technology Festival placed over 500 workshops in schools throughout Goi City and County, hands-on workshops, where students got to touch and feel, to build and create, to learn about the world around us, with workshops on the ocean, nature, climate action, astronomy, physics, chemistry, and technology. We are so grateful to our main sponsor, Medtronic, and the rest of our partners who enable us to provide the full schools program for free to the schools. This evening's event, The Science of Sea Swimming, is about understanding the whys. Why do we have high tides during a full moon? Why do we get such a buzz from swimming in such cold water? and keep going back for more? Why do some people glide through the water while others struggle with their technique? This evening, we are delighted to welcome our three guest speakers, Dr. Jasmine Fairfield, an American physicist who will talk about the link between the moon and the tides, Eastgay Britain, champion surfer and marine social scientist, will talk about our deep connection to the ocean, and Katrina Lynch, swim coach and co-founder of Ebb and Flow Aquatics, will give tips and advice to you all on sea swim. So, our first speaker tonight to the stage is Dr. Jasmine Fairfield. Jasmine is a physics lecturer at NUI Galway, who leads research in nanoscience, physics education, and public engagement with science. She earned a BA in physics and applied math at the University of California, Berkeley in 2005 and holds a master's and PhD in physics, attained at the University of Pennsylvania in 2011. After her PhD, Jasmine joined Trinity College Dublin as a research fellow. In 2018, she completed a residency program in the Arctic Circle, where she worked on a project on the effects of climate change on humans. Alongside publishing in academic journals, she's a regular contributor to the popular science magazine, Physics World a science reporter for news talks, radio show, Future Proof. She is the founder and director of Bright Club Ireland, the research comedy variety night, encouraging academics to discuss their work through stand-up comedy. And she's also the author behind a long Professor Chaosheng Zhang, who takes amazing photos of Galway and the environs and very kindly makes them available for use in presentations. Um, so as Anne said, uh, I've not 
I don't have an original Galway accent, I'm sorry. Um, I moved to Galway about five years ago to take up my position at NUI Galway, and it was really the first place that I had ever lived that had such immediate access to the sea, uh, which I loved because I'm a lifelong swimmer. I've always really loved swimming, but I grew up in New Mexico in the US, which is both a desert and a thousand miles from the sea. So, you know, kind of tough in terms of open water availability, um, but I was really delighted when I moved here to find not only easy access to the sea, but also, you know, a really wonderful swimming community, which I'm sure that many of you are part of. Um, and so I've gotten more and more into swimming the longer that I've been here. Um, I've, never, I've never swum through a whole winter. I'll just get that out right away. I'm sorry. Um, last year I made it into December, which I was very proud of. Um, but at that point, I was also about five months pregnant, and I started to run the risk of bursting my wetsuit. <laughs> so I kind of hung my hat up for the year. Um, but this, this winter, I'm going to try to make it the whole way through. I'm very excited. Um, and I think if you start to spend a lot of time at the seaside, you know, one of the first things that you notice is the tides, right? Is the difference between this kind of a black rock experience um, and this kind of a black rock experience. Now, they're both great, let me be clear. Um, but you know, if, if the water's up here, it's more of a like jumping in situation. You could go up the towers and dive off um, if you're feeling edgy. Uh, but then if the water's down here, it might be more of a like go carefully down all the stairs situation. Um, and if you don't swim at Black Rock, if you swim somewhere like Grattan Beach, then the difference between these two is more of the difference between a nice dip and a half mile walk. So. I actually, I was walking by Grattan Beach this morning and the tide was so far out that it was basically at the aquarium, um, <laughs> which exposes lots of interesting tidal phenomena, I'm sure. Um, but as a swimmer, that's a much longer distance. So why are we getting these huge variations between where the water comes to on the shore? Well, the main thing it really comes down to is the relationship between these three astronomical bodies, right? In blue, we have the Earth. Um, of course, the Earth is rotating around the sun in the middle, in yellow. Um, the Earth is where we are now, in case you didn't know. Uh, and of course, we also have the Moon, which is orbiting around the Earth. So we have these three sort of bodies, which are all feeling the effects of gravity um, with and between themselves. So you know, the Moon is attracted to the Earth gravitationally. The Earth is attracted back. Um, both of those are also attracted to the Sun. And I should point out as well, this is not to scale, right? <laughs> in case you weren't aware, Sun very big, very far away. Um, but you get the idea, right? And so the Earth is spinning, that's where we get day and night from, but it's also traveling in this circular orbit around the sun. Um, and when we get back to where we started out in our orbit, that's the same time of year, so coming back to you know the beginning of the year, or in this case, it's just where the GIF resets. Um, but you know, if it proceeded all the way around, that would bring us back to the same time of year or the same season. So we have these gravitational interactions between these three bodies, but let's kind of zoom in, because the one that is the most rele uh, relevant for the tides is the Earth and Moon interaction. So if you think about them being gravitationally attracted to each other, I mean, that's why the Moon is orbiting around the Earth, right? But it also affects on the oceans that we have. So here we see just the Earth, the Moon, and then the oceans, which are actually also being pulled towards the Moon, right? And water is a bit more mobile than land, so that means that on the side of the Earth next to the Moon, we actually get this slight tidal bulge where the oceans, again, are being pulled toward the Moon. Um, now, some people can get confused about why do you get the bulge on the other side, right? Is that, why is that water moving away from the Moon? And the answer is actually that for the water on the top and bottom of the Earth, that's also being pulled towards the Moon and it's being pulled down towards the Earth. So you get this kind of tidal squeezing effect um, where the ocean is basically being pushed either towards the Moon or the other direction away from the Moon. And on the far side of the Earth from the Moon, we basically have that squeezing effect, as well as the fact that the Moon is further away from that side. Um, so you get this net force in the other direction, basically leading to this sort of, again, not to scale, bulge of water around the Earth. So for us humans on the Earth, what that ends up looking like is this, right? Because the Earth is rotating within this sort of bulge of the sea. And so, I mean, this is, obviously going very fast and slightly nauseating to look at. But you can see, right, the person is going through every single day, every revolution of the Earth, we're going through two high tides and two low tides, right? And so in this diagram, the Moon isn't moving, which isn't accurate because the Moon also is sort of moving around the Earth. But so roughly every 24 hours, you get these two high tides, two low tides. 
And they're coming from the fact that the water is basically gravitationally attracted to the moon. I mean, so is everything else on Earth, but the water is where we see it. Um, but now, again, this is only the Earth-Moon system, right? We also got the sun in there. So let's see what that looks like. The sun is actually doing something very similar. Um, it's also creating a tidal effect, but it's further away, right? So here, um, these diagrams are all from NASA, and you can basically see that we have a solar tide shown here in yellow and a lunar tide that's shown in purple. And sometimes in the orbit of the moon around the Earth, those two tides line up, and other times they don't. Right? So sometimes they're being pulled in the same direction, and sometimes they're not being pulled in the same direction. Um, and so you can see right, that the net effect on the water on Earth is a result both of where the moon is, but also where the sun is. And again, the sun is very big, as we know, but it's very far away. Right? It's not small, it's far away. Um, whereas the moon is a lot smaller, but closer. So the net effect of the tides, or, or the majority of the effect, is coming from the moon, but some amount is coming from the sun. And you can see that actually, where we can actually very easily see this from Earth is by looking at the phase of the moon, right? Because if the moon and the sun are in a line with the Earth, then one of two things is happening. Either it's as the picture shows here, we have a full moon um, on the far side of the Earth from the sun, or if it's on the other side, then we have a new moon, and then again, the Earth and moon and sun are all in alignment. So that's when we get like bigger high tides, right? They're called spring tides, although it's not spring time, it's just two times a month the tides are really big. And what happens when they're sort of uh, at a 90 degree angle to each other? Neap tides, or as I like to call them, not so good tides. So basically you can have not just your two high tides and low tides a day, but also your really high high tides and your not so good high tides, um, which are tied to the lunar cycle as it goes around the Earth. Easy, right? Orbital mechanics, very straightforward. Um, and you can see, right, this is where we're seeing these tides rising and falling on the beach. Um, but sometimes people, you know, see these diagrams, it looks very abstract. Um, so I wanted to just use another possible metaphor around not orbital mechanics, but emotional mechanics. So bear with me. Um, that's me. If you're wondering why I'm wearing a tiara, it's because I got married this summer. Pause for applause, thank you. Um, <laughs> no. And actually, we're really on the ball because we also this spring had a baby. Um, so just getting it all done all done right away. And actually, you know, we have the sun, moon, and earth as a three-body system. But I think also me, my partner Ian, and our baby Eric, we're another three-body system that has complicated interactions. Uh, so I wanted to, to try out this metaphor on you guys. You can tell me what you think um, as another way of understanding the tides and the moon. So obviously, I mean, the, the baby's the smallest, right? So he's gonna be the moon, and I'm still on mat leave, so he's basically just orbiting around me constantly. <laughs> in space um, and you know we have an emotional attraction force with each other I mean we practically can't get away from each other um, in a really nice way and so of course there's me and the baby um, but then say that my partner comes into the room right and so I have my emotional attraction force to the baby but I also have feelings for my partner you know he's important to me too um, he's further away uh, but he's also bigger <laughs> So I, I'm kind of subject to these two forces, right? Um, but now, okay, for it to be a tidal situation, we need some sort of water. Fortunately, postpartum mood swings lead to quite a lot of crying at times. It can be good tears, um, sometimes. So let's say that there's you know, a water <laughs> of some sort being released from me. Um, it's basically gonna be subject to these two forces. So, Right now, they're at 90 degree angles to each other, so the tears are just undirected. They're going every which way. Um, there's a lot happening. Look, if you've had a baby, you know what I mean. Um, but imagine now that the baby is over here, right? And then imagine that my partner comes in. Well, all of the forces are in the same direction now, so like this is gonna be a waterfall. I mean, they're adding, that's, there's a lot going on. Again, it could be good tears. Um, so, this is an interesting metaphor, right? It's got a few problems if we compare it to the actual tides, one of which is that for this to be a good metaphor, I would also have to somehow have like some reverse tears coming out of the back of my head, which isn't how human crying generally works. Um, I think it's also a slightly patriarchal metaphor, right? Because it's like both me and the baby are orbiting around Ian. No, 
we're a modern couple, you know? We orbit around each other, we're more like a binary star system. Um, but the real problem with this metaphor, which you'll immediately recognize if you are a parent, is that we're orbiting the baby. <laughs> Obviously. I mean, he's the middle of everything. He's literally our son. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Hold for applause. Moms can make dad jokes, too. Um, so yeah, we, we certainly, in, in reality, are orbiting the baby, but I think that this raises an interesting question, right? Because right now we just have the one baby, but what would these mechanics look like if there were two babies? Or three? If you have two, three, or even more babies, then you'll recognize that this system is what a physicist would call a chaotic system. <laughs> Um, very hard to solve the dynamics of this system, very hard to do any sort of meaningful calculations um, about what might happen. But if we take this back to the Earth-Moon system, right, which is a little bit simpler for a lot of reasons, what would the tides look like if our planet had multiple moons? Right? That's kind of interesting to think about. Um, because we only have the one, so it's a pretty simple process of like, are the moon and the sun in a line or not? Um, if we had multiple moons, of course, our ocean would have a gravitational attraction to all of those moons. So we would be adding sort of more directional forces, and that means that most of the time, they probably wouldn't add up in any sort of coherent way, right? Like, we would have less recognizable tides than we currently do. But on the rare occasion that you actually had all of the moons in a line with each other, in some sort of, you know, convergence with the sun, you'd get very strong tides. You'd get like super tides. So maybe it's good that this is not the situation that we find ourselves in. Um, but I also wanted to mention the fact that, you know, this Earth, Sun, Moon system is really at the core of a lot of the, the tides that we see. But there's other things that can have an impact too. Um, one of which is obviously land and like what type of land the tides are impacting. So if you were on like a small island just in the middle of the ocean, of course, you would still feel tides, right? The ocean is attracted to the moon, the moon is passing overhead, you get tides. But the tides would actually be a lot smaller than they would be if you were on the edge of a large island, say Ireland, or like a continental shelf. And this is because there's more sort of land for the, the waves and the tidal bulge to impact. And so you get stronger tides near a larger land mass. Um, another thing that can impact the height of the tides as we know here, is wind. So if you have wind coming in off the ocean, that's gonna push the kind of tidal uh, bulge up higher onto the land. If you have wind blowing off of land, you're gonna get the tide going out a little bit further. Um, and one really interesting example, I think, is from the Bay of Fundy in Nova Scotia, which has the claim to fame of having the highest tides in the world, um, 15 meters from low tide to high tide, uh, which is huge. The reason that it has such high tides is actually to do with the shape of the bay. So it's a very large bay and it's kind of like funnel shaped. So basically this means, again, it's subject to the same tidal swell that everything else on planet Earth is, but because it has this sort of funnel shape at the front of the bay, the tide is driven up further into it and the size of the mouth of the bay is close to uh, a wavelength of one of the resonances of the ocean. So basically some sizes of bay will give you higher tides uh, and some shapes of bay, whereas other times, you know, you may have had experiences with like very small openings into lagoons or other sort of inlets where there's very little tidal action, and that's, you know, not to do with the moon being worse there, right? It's due to the shape of the land and how much waves are coming into it. Um, so there are land and sea aspects to the tides as well, but again, it does kind of come back to the earth, the moon, and the sun. And one way to actually remember this really easily, right, is that if you look at the phase of the moon, you can actually tell whether the tides are gonna be really, really high or just kind of high. Um, and does anyone know what the phase of the moon is right now? It's full, yeah, it's, it's very full. Um, and I even said earlier that the low tide this morning was like insanely low, so also the high tides right now are very high. And again, you can know that just by knowing the phase of the moon. Um, or vice versa, if you go in and see like a crazy high tide when you go to swim, you're like, where's the moon? <laughs> like, where is it in the sky? Um, because it's either very full or it's a very new moon. So that's some of the stuff that I think is cool about tides. Um, and I'm really looking forward to teaching my little baby about it. Um, this is his first time ever in the water uh, at the end of this summer. I'm very proud to note that he was not unhappy in the water. He pretty much put up with it. Um, <laughs> and I'm really looking forward to the point where I can tell him 
you know, where the tides come from, about the earth, the moon, and the sun, uh, and about all of this stuff. So thanks very much for your time. Um, and if you want to follow up with me about my baby swimming progress, there I am on Twitter. <laughs> thanks very much. So next tonight, our special guest tonight up next is Eastkey Britton, an Irish surfer from County Donegal with a doctorate in environment and society from the University of Ulster. Eastkey was competing in surfing competitions before she was eight years old and having won multiple Irish national surfing championships, she was the first female surfer to ride the big wave all in Yosarok, off the cliffs of Moher in 2007. The 15-foot wave was featured in the Irish documentary film Wave Riders. Eastkey is the first woman to be nominated for the Billabong XXL Awards for her performance toe surfing at Ireland's premier big wave spot, Mullock Moor, in February 2011, becoming the first woman to do so. A scientist, a writer, an accomplished painter and filmmaker, as well as a dedicated surfer. The sea has been her passion since she was a little girl. First encounter the crashing waves of the ocean at home in Rosnaula, County Donegal. She recently published a book, Salt Water in the Blood. Iski has been at the forefront of pioneering research showing how rivers, lakes and oceans impact our physical, mental and emotional well-being. In 2017, her academic work as a marine social scientist with Near Health Project at NUI Galway focused on what she intuitively knew from a young age, that the sea has the power to heal. The question is, scientifically, why are we donning our swimming togs in our droves and leaping into the cold water? Please put your hands together for Eastkey Britain. Thanks, everyone. So I wanted to share with you tonight a kind of mix of uh, probably what some of you already so intuitively know and feel, but that pull water has on us, as well as the tidal pull. Uh, I was born on a new moon, so I can definitely relate to what Desmond was sharing, and in January during stormy season high wind. So I wonder how that influences a person's experience of life and personality. But I want to talk more to the sea, uh, the sea's power to heal, and it has incredible power to heal, but also, despite it being one of these last sort of wild places that are freely accessible to the public, there still persists huge inequalities around access. Um, and for many, coastal spaces and places can be experienced as exclusionary, risky, or dangerous. Um, even overwhelming uh, or inaccessible in many cases. So a lot of the work I do is looking at how do we create a more inclusive ocean and how do we bring greater diversity into these spaces? And then what that means in terms of the impact it has on the well-being of our communities as well as us as individuals. And in turn, uh, what happens if we become more immersed in water and begin to build that kind of relationship and understanding with it? Does that spill over into how we not only want to care for ourselves, but also for the water. So to speak to some of that, I wanted to share a really short video clip um, that kind of illustrates the importance of organizations and groups that really help create this sort of safe, enabling, and inclusive space, in particular, the ebb and flow swim community, who you'll hear much more about later uh, after me, and groups like the Octopus Swim Club, uh, and how they really help foster this community and connection. Despite all the resources and supports and resilience in my life, I would not survive without having access to the sea. And I've felt such joy and gratitude for that, and at the same time this upwelling of such grief and sadness that so many people either had that taken away or don't have it as a way to just to heal. When you're swimming in the sea, number one is the freedom it gives you, the sense of mobility. You go into the sea with a lot of things bothering you, a lot of crap in your head, it's dumped out there. You're not thinking about anything else. It doesn't matter what else is going on in your life. You're just, you're in the sea. There's always somebody that enjoyed the sea. I ended up in a wheelchair 13 years ago when I thought that swimming was finished for me, as was a lot of other things. Fortunately, I got to meet some amazing people that rethought me how to swim and the sea. 
I never lived really near the sea until about nine years ago we moved to Galway and I remember walking the prom shortly after we moved here and seeing people get in in the middle of winter and just thinking I really want to do that but I didn't know anyone else who did it at the time and I didn't have the nerve to do it by myself. I always wanted to swim so I said now, now is the time I want to go and learn. That's when I first came in contact with Ashling and the girls. We love what we do, so we're trying to share that and open that space up to other people. Coaching people how to, to love the water, I guess, really, and doing it in a very safe environment. Guiding them how to, to safely enter the space and respect it, um, respect the people around them, and obviously work with the conditions every day. Give them a little toolkit to work with, to use, when I like first came here to Galway, I didn't know anyone, didn't have any connection to place. I was really unsettled. I'd just come back from years of traveling. I had no real connection to home other than it being family. And then I'm in this urban setting, which is kind of alien and unfamiliar. I didn't really find my place here until I started to actually go in the sea. And that was by meeting other women who were also going in the sea. It doesn't matter if you go down on your own, even you just still get chatting to the people who are beside you and stuff. It's just there's something about the sea that just brings out the best in everybody. Like they come together as their own community and they feel safer within that that they can share this experience and be in that environment with other people. Everybody will go through life and there will always be hiccups. We call them hiccups, be them a medical hip hiccup or a financial hiccup or something like that. The real challenge is to pick yourself up from that. And if you can do that, you can do anything. Yeah, so Freedom of the Sea was a short edit film just at the start of this summer, actually, with Katrina, the Ebb and Flow community, and, and David Kennedy, who you heard speaking as well. Um, and I guess it, it speaks to many of the themes I want to touch upon, but also even just as I'm watching it again, recognition that so many of my connections or sense of community to Galway, having you know come sort of as an outsider five or six years ago to work at NUI Galway, not knowing anyone, it comes through the sea, um, and a lot of those connections first form through sea swimming, and um, so it's, yeah, it's just wonderful to even recognize in, in this sort of small group or community that we have here, how many of us share that bond. So as I'm, I'm a bit of a hybrid, so as a, as a, you know, a surfer, scientist, writer, um, basically all of my life has been shaped and formed by my relationship with the ocean from my place of birth growing up in, in Donegal and learning to stand on a surfboard from the age of four. Um, in terms of the science, some would call me either marine social scientist or social ecologist. So my work, what that means is that my work and research is about understanding relationships, um, and in particular our relationship with the ocean. And for me it's about looking at how we might restore those relationships or repair, rebuild, uh, wherever they have been broken. Uh, and better understanding how to reconnect with the living world um, in, in particular. And for example, you see that happening you know, through in different ways, through things like surf therapy. This image was taken during a liquid therapy surf program in Donegal. Um, but also how these positive, immersive experiences in the sea can foster cross-cultural connection, build leadership capacities, and body confidence, especially uh, for women and young girls. The images you see here are from a program called Be Like Water in, in Iran, where we kind of went back into that beginner's mindset of what it was first like to encounter water. Uh, how do we bring in a playful element instead of a performative aspect? So taking away that kind of perception of, of failure um, or pressure to perform was really important. And stories really matter. You know, we need a new narrative of the sea, and that's slowly being shaped and formed. And I'm seeing it, the transformation of that, especially in the last um, last couple of years. But this new narrative of the sea is one that breaks down these false and dualist, dualistic notions of otherness and separateness, and instead celebrates the ocean as a great unifier. Um, so the influence of living by natural cycles, like living by the tides, like so many of us do here, and. As a scientist, it's really important to communicate the science in different ways. Um, so I have a couple of books come out this year. The first one earlier this year called 50 Things to Do by the Sea. 
And it's all about ways we can better understand the ocean, and especially the link between ocean health and human health. Um, how we might learn to read the, the ocean, almost like the, the language of the sea, um, which is kind of built up over sort of layers and layers of experience through my own lifetime and immersion, but then trying to understand the science behind that and then breaking, down, breaking that down into kind of these ways we can actually tap into it consciously or put it into meaningful action or practice in our lives. And it, it includes obviously the benefits of sea swimming, which I'll speak to more shortly. And I draw on lessons learned from a lifetime spent in real intimate contact with the ocean in, in my new book, Saltwater in the Blood. Um, I was busy running around a few bookshops in town, signing them, so there's, there's copies available as well if you're interested to learn more. But what it's about is it's really attempting to translate some of that felt wonder and awe from the ocean into our everyday lives. It's about restoring our connection with the aliveness, with the living world, and that's going to be a kind of constant theme with the ocean as a, as a breathing ocean. And drawing on, in my case, surfing really is my medium, but surfing in the sea is this powerful metaphor for how we live our lives. So I'll speak to some of those spillover effects in terms of the health benefits of, of something like sea swimming into the rest of our lives as well in a moment when I share some case studies. Currently, my role is as a Blue Health researcher. I'll explain what Blue Health means in just a moment. And I work with Inclusi. I work in partnership with liquid therapy and surf therapy organizations across five countries. This is an EU Erasmus Plus funded project. And what I love about it is like it's, it's very much about the applied research, so working with practitioners to address their needs and, and develop best practices to help foster a more inclusive ocean space uh, and greater access for people, in this case, with physical disabilities or sensory impairment in surfing. And I wanted to situate this, and when we talk about the science of sea swimming, what's happening in the sort of the bigger global picture. Um, so you could say a blue wave is rising. This growing interest across policy, practice, academia, to better understand the links between uh, the health of our water environments, especially the ocean, so between ocean health and human health, and how they interact with our human activities. What is in blue health is, is a kind of emerging research discipline uh, across many different disciplines of, of science and academia that looks at the physical and mental benefits of being in, on, near or underwater. So this is just a snapshot of uh, the kind of tip of the iceberg in the research that's really building um, and projects in this space in the last couple of years. And it builds on a book by Wallace J. Nichols, which you'll see here called Blue Mind, which is looking at the kind of the neuroscience and psychology behind the effect of water, which is probably a whole other session. <laughs> So in this context, where is the swimming situated? And um, the sciencey bit. <laughs> I carried out what's called a blue care systematic review. So looking at the therapeutic uh, impact or benefit of various activities in blue spaces, so water environments, um, and looking at studies that have been done around the world with colleagues of mine at NUI Galway, Geisha Kinderman, Katrina Carlin, and Christine Domigan. Uh, but really surprisingly, what I just wanted to highlight here is that despite the huge rise in sea swimming and how low cost and accessible it is, especially compared to some other water-based activities, very few studies uh, were focused on it in, in the context of blue care or the ther therapeutic part of it. Uh, actually, only one study in this review um, included swimming, sea swimming, which I think we're really missing a beat. <laughs> We decided then, as part of the Near Health Project, to explore this gap and evidence the health and well-being impacts of sea swimming as one of a number of these of nature-based kind of case studies as part of the EPA HSE funded Near Health Project. Um, and as part of this sea swimming, we included sea swimming as a case study, actually partnered with uh, Ebb and Flow. And this was part of a na larger national study. And we published a report and toolkit on that that came out last year. Um, the toolkit, <coughs> sorry, is called Connecting with Nature for Health and Wellbeing. So if you want a deeper dive, <laughs> too many puns, um, you can check that out. But I'm going to share some of that now. 
Yeah, and what I, was, I wanted to point out there about healing water, heal ourselves, I'm gonna come back to that at the end, but I feel like this work um, is part of a wider narrative on how we might create a culture of care and reciprocity. So I wanna get back to that interdependence between the health of water and our own human health. Um, in the toolkit, you, there's a, a lovely snapshot that summarizes some of the key outcomes and impacts of, of the sea swimming case study, which is carried out here in Galway. I won't go into it in too much depth, and I know we'll hear more also from Katrina about how they put this into practice to realize these health and well-being outcomes, but some really key factors to kind of the success of it for um, our enhancing our well-being is the importance of creating a safe and enabling environment so that we're able to kind of to, to meet our fears um, in a really positive way. And then removing these perceptions of failure. And this, these are kind of commonly come up across these um, water-based interventions. And also then this why, why the sea itself is really, plays a really important role, of course. And the benefits of the multiple challenges it, it presents. So this aspect of challenge is really important for our own, building our own resilience and personal development. Um, and we're, we're meeting a you know, constantly changing environment of seas, tides, and weather all the time. So unsurprisingly, this led to widespread significant benefits across well-being indicators. You can see uh, for sea swimming here, there was significant increases in many sort of well-being indicators or measures, um, self-reported measures for our well-being and quality of life outcomes. Uh, I won't dwell on them too much here, but just to, to show that a common theme that came up both in the survey we carried out <coughs> and in the interviews, is this kind of the use of the sea swimming or immersion as a coping mechanism for mental health. And, and the quote from one of the swimmers we interviewed here kind of just highlights for me why, there, why is there still such a disconnect in how we do healthcare and recognizing the impact of our environment on our health and the benefits of accessing a healthy environment, especially uh, water environments. And wouldn't it be incredible to start to see these complement each other, um, to see things like sea swimming be, be the complement to our healthcare and health promotion, uh, or perhaps even an alternative. What was most significant in terms of the outcomes was around connectedness, and this comes up again and again. Um, the <clears throat> so you see here again various nature-based activities. We looked at, and the most significant finding was that out of all the activities, sea swimming enhances a sense of connectedness across all domains of life that we um, measured with the participants in the study. And okay, there are many reasons for this. I think one is to do with the multi-sensory quality of the sea. Sea swimming is, is the most immersive of all the activities where our whole bodies um, are immersed in that environment, so it's a very embodied experience. And there's also a profound spillover effect into all other aspects of life. So you see how it can enhance, um, which I'll speak to in a, in a moment as well, but this kind of ease of communication and feeling of openness, that kind of um, post-swim transformation everyone has, like the energy just gets lifted. But that spills over not only into that sense of community and connection within the swimming group, but into other aspects of people's lives, into family, work, and school. And then having that profound sense of connection with the sea also spills over into a recognition of the aliveness of the world around us, not just, not just the ocean. And I think there are similar findings in a very recent study by Adele Murray and Jack, Jackie Fox, also at NUI Galway. I don't know if they're here tonight. Um, looking at it from the occupational therapy point of view, <clears throat> but that this sense of connection and connectedness was really important. How am I doing for time? <laughs> um, such a big topic, topic to try to distill. But so I looked into this kind of sense of place connection in particular a little bit further in another paper I co-authored with a uh, human or health geographer, Ronan Foley. If you are interested in the research on sea swimming, uh, his work is really foundational on studying sea swimming over the last decade in Ireland. Um, from that health geography perspective. But in this paper, Sensing Water, we wanted to explore how diverse or different groups engage with, with water and with the sea as health enabling, both the you know, informal swimming groups as well as, as formal. And what I wanted to highlight here, just a, a quote from a section in the paper, 
is again this value of sea swimming as a public resource and that it provides us with this situated resilience. So this resilience we get by developing this relationship with the place, this place connection over time. Oh, skipping ahead too much. <laughs> and then crucially this embodied difference. So what that means is that this kind of feeling, sense of all bodies feeling welcome and feeling free from earthly limits and the constraints of, of, a, of our land-based lives and it becoming a place uh, of emotional diversity. So what comes up again and again in, in interviews with sea swimmers is that it is a place without judgment. And this seems to be coming up even, uh, not just in Ireland, but also cross-culturally, uh, where all emotions are welcome. So it's a place of, of powerful release when it comes to our emotions. Other trends, which don't have enough time to get into, but they kind of blow my mind, um, are there's exciting breakthroughs emerging in medical research. This is just one example of a study in the UK on uh, how cold water swimming can help reduce the risk of dementia. Um, the science behind that is the discovery of protein that's released in the brain uh, in cold water or BN3, um, that's supposed to play, play a key role. But then there's you know, other, other science coming out in terms of cold water swimming throughout pregnancy and how that can help reduce the uh, reduce you know, potential difficulties during labor. Um, maybe some women here could attest otherwise, but... <laughs> Um, and, and then why salt water, the benefits it has on, on so many levels, but in terms of inflammation or immune response, uh, alleviating the symptoms of things like uh, cystic fibrosis and uh, pulmonary flare-ups. Um, but I guess, why is it so surprising? I mean, we are bodies of water. I think we live in a society that tries to tell us this story that we're separate, uh, when in fact we are water, we're part of the water cycle. Um, the water in our bodies is replaced 17 times a year, I think. Maybe perhaps don't quote that on me, but it's, you know, <laughs> it's, it's we are, when we, when we go and swim in these places and the water we drink in the places where we live, it becomes literally part of who we are. And, and then I'm also interested in why water, why now, we're all seeing this huge pull the ocean is having on us. And I think we're beginning to realize you know, this great need to better understand our interdependence with living, breathing spaces. Um, and how to, to enhance the sense of ocean literacy. So the ability to understand the ocean's effect on us and our effect on it. And it happens through things like, say, having, uh, this is an example of an image taken during swim week on Inish Turk Island. So just you know, learning to swim in the sea uh, and how much more you're learning than just swimming technique and the connect place connection that creates that bond with that particular body of water for the rest of uh, one's life, possibly. And then how we bring it into thinking more creatively about um, how, we, how we do things, how we come together. Um, I love this example of the Swimposium, which was held this summer as part of uh, Swimming a Long Way Together by artist uh, Vanessa Dawes. But this kind of fusion where we journeyed along the, the coastline of, of Dublin to these different swim spots. Um, we had a mix of these talks and academics and poetry and then swimming and then even presenting on the water, which was <laughs> pretty, um, definitely the most unusual kind of lectern experience I've had. Uh, but, but why not you know, integrate it into more of our lives? Because it does influence um, you know, our, our sense of self, how we express ourselves, how we communicate, um, and it does, need not be an, an add-on in our lives. And, during these times, this pull to the sea is also in response to a deep longing, of course, for the connection, but even the physical touch, among other things. Um, and then that social connection, so seeing the, the post-swim transformation of ease and openness through the shared bond of the sea, this profound place connection. And also, how I think one of the other most common um, things people will share about their experiences is how water holds us. Um, and seawater does that, I mean, such an effortless way. It's no surprise, really, is it, that seawater is the same density as amniotic fluid, the water in the womb. And the evidence supports 
that this deeper understanding through, through this immersion comes this deeper understanding of the endangered and vulnerable nature of water. Um, and it, it is, these experiences we have through, through something like sea swimming helps increase this kind of blue attunement in which being in water forces a deeper form of listening. And I think that's really critical for the challenges we currently face and the challenges to come. And that if we were to restore water, we also have to restore ourselves. You know, if we're looking at our own health, uh, the health of the water really matters because we can't be well in a sick sea. So, thank you. I think we all related so much to everything you had to say there, especially the environment, the benefits to your health. It's such, it's such a fantastic um, facility for us to be able to access every day. Um, thank you, Iski. Our next speaker tonight, last but not least, is um, Katrina Lynch, swim coach and co-founder in 2015 of Ebb and Flow Aquatics. Katrina is passionate about helping people learn to swim and inspired to share her love for the water, in particular open water swimming with others, creating a safe, nurturing environment, both in the pool and open water, is at the core of what Ebb and Flow is about. Katrina and her team have over 20 years shared experience teaching people how to swim and develop swimming confidence, giving them the space to connect to their bodies and move fluidly through the water. Katrina's true aquatic passion lies in open water swimming and exploring how our health and well-being are intricately linked to the health of the ocean. She feels she was gifted this sea connection from her family ancestry on the west coast of Ireland and she has a responsibility to honour it. The Ebb and Flow Water family has grown massively since inception and have an amazing team of coaches, support crew and swimmers of all abilities and who who are forever grateful to those unsuspecting, brave souls for taking the first leap of faith into the unknown. Please put your hands together for Katrina Lynch. Hello, everybody. OK, I'm used to speaking down at Black Rock, so these lights are <laughs> quite bright for me. But um, it's actually great to be here. Um, I suppose for me, it's just everything coming together. My own interests in sea swimming and then becoming a coach. Um, so it's just lovely to be here in a room full of people. I suppose what I can give you is some tips um, how we would coach our swimmers and how to be safe in the water, how to read the conditions, and also just how to be a better, more efficient swimmer. So the technique side of things. We're just going to touch a little bit on it, but obviously it's very difficult to I can't promise you that you're all going to be brilliant swimmers when you leave here, but I can definitely give you some tips. Um, so just out of curiosity, there's a lot of people here. I can see some of you. Um, how many are, would consider themselves dippers? Oh, that's better. Thank you. <laughs> Hands up. Who would be a dipper here? OK, great. Um, who would consider themselves new to swimming, like just started swimming in the last 19 months during COVID? OK, brilliant. And then who are those who would swim regularly um, all year round for the last number of years here in Galway? Yeah, so great. It's lovely to see that there are all different levels and abilities um, and experiences because those things are important. Um, for us, I suppose, as coaches, it's really good to know where people come from, what background they have. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Evan Flow first, just touch on what we do briefly. Um, just out of curiosity, is everybody that's here from Galway, or is there anybody not from Galway that swims elsewhere? You're all familiar with the locations in Galway, yeah? Okay, great. Um, so our story, this is my sister, Sarah and I, um, set up this business in 2015. Um, we would have both worked as pool coaches before that. Um, so we would have coached a lot of people here in Galway, some down in Kerry. Um, we grew up in Kerry, and our mother's from Galway, so we moved to here. So our experience, really, we, we would have been surrounded by the sea our whole lives as well, and the pool, so we had access to both, which was really amazing. Um, I kind of would have taken more connection to the sea than Sarah, so we had a nice balance between us. She would consider herself a pool swimmer, I would consider myself a sea swimmer. So I suppose we just 
put our brains together and we love what we do, so we wanted to share that with other people. Um, we come from a very coastal area in Kerry as well, in North Kerry, um, and it's very tidal. It's actually not very safe to swim there, but we would have been surrounded by what Jasmine and Iski spoke about, the influence of being that close to the sea had on our lives, like just watching how the tide was ever changing, um, you know, going to bed listening to the sea at night, it had a huge impact on our lives and it's great that we can actually, you know, make it our, our work now. So obviously we can't do this without our team, we have a massive team um, of coaches. When I say massive, obviously our coaches are a huge part of that, we have a full safety team, we provide all our own safety for our, our classes. Um, but it's, it spans wider than that. We actually have people on shore making sure that the swimmers are okay in water, are communicating with us. They're actually doing beach cleans when they're doing that as well, which is a huge part of what we do. And then the swimmers themselves, I feel that they're part of our team because we're constantly learning from them. You know, we tune into what they're looking for. Um, we watch them grow and then we try to provide, you know, additional kind of supports for them as they go. So it's definitely a really good team. I know a lot of the team are actually here this evening, so it's lovely to see you all. Um, yeah, like I said, it's really just about sharing our knowledge and our passion between all of us. Like, you'll probably recognize a lot of these people here. A lot of, most of you know Paddy McNamara. Um, there's Robert Mooney's there. I know he's in the audience as well. Ashling and Caroline. Um, yeah, so we just really enjoy what we do. We want to share that with people and educate people and make them more comfortable and confident and competent swimmers, especially in open water. As all of you know, like it's, it's forever changing. It's always, every day you go to swim either at Black Rock, Ladies Beach, Grattan Beach, wherever it is, it's never the same conditions, you know? So educating yourself about what the tide is doing on each and every day, especially for those of you who are new to swimming, is, is really, really important. And before you even talk about like technique and, and becoming efficient and confident in the water, it's really about reading the conditions and knowing your location and where you're swimming at. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to touch briefly on a couple of safety tips uh, and then I'll talk a little bit more about the technique side of things and get you to do a couple of exercises for me so you'll have to get up on your feet and do some deep breathing. I hope you're okay with that. Um, yeah, like I said, know your environment. So whether you're you're here, you're from Galway, you, you know your location, but it's always good to just check what the tide is doing. You know, check it on an app. Um, there's some really good apps out there that we can share with you afterwards. Um, and then just like what the wind is doing on the particular day, but also how you're feeling on that particular day is really important as well. Um, getting in and out of the water safely, you know, is all well and good on a high tide, but how is that on a low tide, you know? Or if you, if you always go there on a low tide, um, and then you're going on a high tide, just making sure that you're always aware what's happening um, and that you're safely entering and exit, exiting properly. Um, number one rule, never swim alone. Um, now, I know a lot of people who swim alone. I swim alone sometimes myself, but I always, always, always let somebody know where I am and when I go swimming. And I'm always close to shore. So that's really, really important. Um, it gives you a safety backup if anything happens to you. Because, you know, us as coaches giving advice to people to swim in these beautiful locations, if we don't tell them that safety is the number one priority, it's, you know, it's, it's a big risk to, to put on them. Um, and also, if you're not familiar with the area and if you're away anywhere in Ireland or anywhere um, on holidays, just make sure that you ask somebody from the area um, and check if there's a lifeguard on duty because it's safer. Also, you're, like I said, yourself, it's, it's, it's well and good knowing the area, but know your own personal limits as well. Um, you know, these, this last couple of years, we've seen a huge influx of people attracted to the sea, which is amazing. It really, really is. But you always are learning all the time. So just check in with yourself all the time and know how you're feeling on that particular day um, and how well you're functioning at different times of the year as well, because you know, as the winter is creeping in, the temperature is growing down. Obviously, it's, it's actually been quite mild, as a lot of you experience at the moment, but it will drop soon. So how do you prepare yourself for that um, is crucially important to the enjoyment of it, I suppose, really. Um, yeah, again, if you're not sure or not feeling confident on, on a day, you know, just don't go. Being by the sea is enough sometimes, you know, walking in it, dipping your toes, 
sometimes it's enough. Or if you get caught up with other people in a group and you're just not feeling it that day, just don't do it. You know, it's just not, it's just not safe. Um, yeah, just stay on, stay, stay within your depth and close to the shore. I think this, you know, goes for everybody, whether you're an experienced swimmer or whether you're new to it. Um, it's always safer to sh swim parallel and close to shore because even the most experienced swimmer can get a cramp, can just have a bad day, might have had a good night's sleep, you might get into difficulty. So, you're, you know, if you stay close to shore, you just walk to shore rather than trying to swim back to where you came from. You know, so, so little things like that, even as an experienced swimmer, I always remind myself of those things because I never know what can happen. You know, as, as comfortable as I am, as experienced I am, as I am in the sea, like, you know, you're in an environment that's ever changing. So be always aware of that. And again, always get out wanting more, you know, um, especially if you're new to swimming and you feel like there's such a buzz, there's such an adrenaline rush when you go in and you really get caught up in that and you're chatting and, and it's amazing, but you don't want to go too far that you get too cold or, you know, you go home and you just can't warm up. You know, that, that, that's where it's just that's a little stretch too far. Um, so just check in with yourself when you're in, in the cold water, especially those that are new to swimming, or even again, those experienced swimmers that when that drop does come, that you're just checking in with yourself, whether you swim with a wetsuit or without a wetsuit, that can happen. And like I said, if you haven't had a good night's sleep the day before, then that can affect your swim the following day. Um, and just be aware of those things. Again, get out wanting more and your whole experience will be much more positive. Um, over the last couple of years, I suppose, from experience, just working with people, observing people, our, our normal, um, when I say normal, pre-COVID, our structure of what we do would be um, taking people from a pool environment and transitioning them into the open water. So we would spend a lot of time just watching and observing people, giving them technical tips, video analysis, um, whether that's somebody that has a fear of water or somebody that's maybe training for an open water swimming event or a triathlon. Um, we would spend a lot of time with them in the pool environment. So it's safe, it's contained, it's controlled, and we would be able to kind of like hold space for them and, and take them one-to-one -one and just guide them through whatever difficulties they're having. Um, and through that, I suppose, we were noticing lots of common things coming up that were, were for all different levels of swimmers that, that were holding them back. So whether you had that, that person that was like, you know, had an underlying fear of water or someone that's that at the higher end, that's, that's a triathlete, um, you know, breathing was a huge part of that across the spectrum. And that holds you back from, you know, entering water, first of all, if you have a deep fear, or even just moving fluidly through water. So for us to be able to teach and, and a system that we use, if we, I'm not a scientist, but we, we put a lot of work into the science of it as well, um, and the technique of it. So our philosophy really would be the three key elements of swimming would be relax, let go, flow. And really, you know, we're not reinventing the wheel or anything. Um, it just breaks it all down because to learn something, especially like with swimming, it's a very technical sport. It requires us to deconstruct it a little bit and deconstructing it breaks it down into manageable pieces for people. Um, and you know yourself with swimming that it's, it's a journey, you know, even a, a, an experienced swimmer, you're always learning. And there's a lot of our swimmers here that started with us back in 2015 and they're still learning, you know, they're still, you know, they would have started, you know, barely been able to swim from Black Rock to the first boy. And now they're doing the Galway Bay swim, you know, and more and more and more and more. So it takes time, uh, it takes commitment and good coaches, obviously. Um, and yeah, just, just to know that you never stop learning. And those that are new to it as well, you know, don't get caught up in, in like the whole swimming side of things. You know, just enjoy it. Just be in the water is enough. Just learning the basics, floating balance, body position, how to be confident in different changing conditions as well is really important and build up gradually. I mean, the boys in Black Rock, they're wonderful to look at and when they come out, everybody gets so, so excited, but they can also be very daunting for people as in they feel like they have to swim to them. So don't be overwhelmed by that. You know, if you swim parallel to a beach that's like 50 meters, if that's your challenge for the year, that's enough, you know, or just like I said, just being in it, learning how to, to float, properly, that's enough as well. 
So just going back to the whole kind of technique side of things that I'm going to go into now, um, the first place we would start with everybody is again with breathing, because we find you know, that, that that does hold people back and it holds tension in your body and that creates muscle tension as well. Um, and it creates you know, a tightening or, or people fighting the water, which you probably have experienced yourself you know, from maybe from a young age starting or as an adult learning how to swim. And that also creates a blockage in your, your mind as well or a frustration that you can't kind of overcome that. And then you're not moving fluidly or smoothly through the water. Um, and again, you're losing a lot of energy. So breathing is where we always start. Um, let go then would it be all about kind of the apprehension, the tension, expectation that we're holding in our bodies. Like I spoke about the expectation, that goes for, for even advanced swimmers. You know, you know they're, they're trying to do, you know, maybe a certain amount of time for a 100 meter split and their expectation is so high that that's actually holding them back. And even trying to teach someone that, you know, less is more sometimes or slowing down to go faster is actually more important. Um, so we work a lot with people on the, on the psychology side of it as well and just trying to let go of that, what, what is actually holding them back. Um, flow then is really all about the movement. Once you learn how to relax, you're breathing, you're doing the basics, you know, the fundamentals of being in water, like your breathing, your balance, your body position, you're letting go of all the tension. That's when the real flow and that's when the real movement comes. Um, and again, that's really, you know, for us, observing someone and watching them going through that journey and educating them on how all of these elements are so important to ultimately become really comfortable in the water. Now, saying all this, like I said, you know, we would usually work in a very controlled environment like the pool, um, but this applies to the open water as well. And even more so, I suppose, you may feel like you're a confident swimmer on a day, but then the conditions change and that throws, throws it all, or you haven't been in the sea all year, and you go from the pool to the sea and you feel like confident in the pool and not in the sea. Again, using these principles of just relax, just breathe, take your time, let go of the tension and the fear that you're, you're feeling on that particular day, and then it'll really be a lot better and, and easier to move in the water. So we're just gonna talk, or I'm going to talk briefly about just six key components that I think are really important to open water swimming, um, and swimming in general, I suppose, really. So the first one is all about your breathing. So I'm gonna get you to do a little breathing exercise. I want you to put one of your hands on your chest and one on your stomach, okay? And just take a couple of deep breaths for me, okay? And I'll guide you through something in a second. So you can do this with your eyes open or closed, it doesn't really matter. Um, a couple of nice deep breaths. Now, the next time you breathe, I want you to just check in. This is an exercise we do a lot of the time in the water. And what we notice is that a lot of our breath actually comes from up here in our chest. And we see people breathing in like this, okay? It's shallow, it's coming from the chest, the shoulders are high. So what I want you to feel when you're breathing in is that actually your belly rises, okay? So when you breathe in, that you should feel an expansion of your belly. And as you exhale, Relax down. So I want you to do a couple of deep breaths on your own. Just really tune into that. What we're trying to do is get a lot of air down here, deep into your lungs, into your diaphragm. So you're really filling your lungs, you're inhaling. Belly rises, exhale. The belly falls. So again, making sure that the, you're, you're getting as much air in there as possible and that you're really exhaling nice and slowly. So. This is something that you can take away with you. If you're going to Black Rock tomorrow, if you're in the pool, wherever you go, can you do that before you get into the water? It relaxes your body. Can you tune into the conditions on the day? You know, it's, it's a really simple thing to do, but it actually really helps you. Um, doing that before you get into the water and even when you're in the water, there's a tendency sometimes when we get into the water, we're just there to swim and we wanna just move straight away. But, you know, taking your time, again, really, really will help you move and flow a lot better in the water. Um, so, like I said, it's, it's where we start with everybody, really, and you'll find that um, you can use it at, a, at every level. Um, then when we talk about actually swimming itself, so, you know, 
breathing out under the water is hugely important as well. So like I, I said, when we're trying to, to, to take a, a breath in when we're swimming, if you imagine as I'm coming to take a breath, my head is on the side, I'm filling my lungs with air, and what you don't want to feel is this. Okay, because again, that's tension in your body. You're scrunching up your shoulders, you're shallow breathing from here. So you really, your shoulders should be back and relaxed. You're coming up to take a breath. So you're breathing in through your mouth and exhaling through your nose. Okay, it's a really simple thing. You think, I do that if I'm a swimmer, I do that. But just try again to really tune in with your breath. And if you find yourself when you're taking your breath in and you're doing this, it's a short breath and it's not really filling your lungs, okay? From the belly. And consciously, when you're exhaling as well, relax your face, relax your cheeks. Try to feel the bubbles kind of trickle down. Again, so that's a little tip you can use whether you're in the pool or the sea. Um, your body position, hugely important again in swimming. So when we talk about your breathing, your floating, relaxing, your body position in the water, you know, if you're, um, again, if you go to the pool or the sea, Start with your breathing exercises and just do a simple float in the water. So you want to be standing, stretch out your hands, take a nice step, deep breath in, exhale into the water. Okay? You should, you should be kind of like a flat body position. So your eyes should be looking down, your head and neck should be neutral, and your eyes should be looking straight down at the pool floor or else at the sea, all the lovely seaweed, or if you have visibility at all tomorrow. Um, just make sure that your, your body position is nice and neutral. So, so basically, that's the setup of your stroke. So if, you're, if your body position is, is relaxed, if it's strong, then it's easier to move fluidly through that. Again, if you, if you find yourself when you're swimming, kind of looking upwards all the time, it drops your legs at the back. So it's really important to have a nice, neutral spine, looking down, and then rotating over from that point. Okay, so just try that, just a floating position if you can, tomorrow or whenever you go swimming again, really relaxing your breath. Um, next one then would be kind of, I know this, a lot of you may, may not be at the stage where you're actually swimming in the sea yet, but even if you've access to the pool, these are good exercises to try. Um, so when we look at the stroke after that, the next thing we would do from our, from our streamlined body position would be to take a stroke, okay? So in all kinds of conditions, you want to be, again, as relaxed as possible. So your hand should enter the water really nice and relaxed. Fingertips kind of, imagine the fingertips going into the water first. Fingertips going in first, and then it's nice and smooth and relaxed, okay? And regardless of, of kind of the conditions that you have, try to keep that elbow nice and high above the water and then a nice relaxed entry into the water. You'll find in, in all sorts of conditions, having a nice high arm or high elbow over the water will help you. Um, again, if there's a wave, oncoming wave, getting your hand over that will be really helpful. Or if you feel like your hand is kind of dropping into the water, that creates like almost like a breaking um, feeling in the water. So just try that. Bring the elbow up, place the hands nice and, and smoothly, thinking of your middle finger kind of entering the water first. Um, again, middle finger. Trying not to overreach as well is, is um, a lot of the time in swimming we think if, I'm as, if I stretch as long as possible or if I'm kind of, you know, gliding or stretching, there's a tendency to kind of overreach. So if I asked you to stretch to your two hands, just put your two hands out in front of you, kind of shoulder distance apart, and as if you're stretching or reaching for something, okay? So when you think of reaching in your stroke, you don't want to overreach, so feel like you're, you're going from your shoulders. You really want to feel like you're using your whole body to stretch through. So making sure that when you take your stroke, that you're not overreaching like this because your hand is flat then. Your reach really comes when your hand is in the water. You're reaching your body through and then pulling back, okay? After you've put your hand into the water, the underwater phase would be to pull the water back behind you so that it moves you forward. And that's a really, really important part of the stroke. So if you set up your body position, you're looking down, 
you're pulling, your hand is entering nice and smooth into the water and you're making sure that your elbow is nice and high, that you're not putting a break on or dropping your elbow, that you're really pulling your body strong under the water, then by having that nice high elbow, as your hand enters the water nice and relaxed, now this is when you start to connect with the water. And connecting with the water is what actually moves us forward. So making sure as that hand goes in, you have connection with the water, you're pulling it back, pushing it back behind you towards your hip to move it all the way so that your body moves forward. So that it's a nice, long, smooth stroke. So once we finish that part, the arm comes out of the water. Again, it's nice and high. You're recovering your hand so that you can have a nice, strong pull underwater. Um, and again, the last thing would be kick. Um, a lot of the time, you know, people that, that wear wetsuits feel like they don't have to kick. And again, it does give you a lot of buoyancy in the water, which is good. But just a little bit of movement from your hips is good. Then if you find like you, you swim without a suit, or even people who swim with a suit might kick a lot and feel like the kick is going to get me really fast, really far. Actually, the opposite is true. What we just talked about, getting your arm in and pulling and connecting with the water actually gives you better propulsion than your kick. So try next time you go in, just tune into your kick. And say, am I kicking a lot here? Even if you're just dipping like this in the water, am I using my legs an awful lot? Because that uses a lot of energy. If you look at the, the largest muscle in your body, your, your quadriceps, you know, you're, you're using those to kick. And if you're using, overusing those, it's going to expend a lot of energy. So just make sure, even if you are, like I said, if you're a dipper and you're just in the water, just use your hands back and forth to keep yourself afloat in a gentle kick. And if you are a freestyle swimmer and you're, you're swimming, make sure that your kick is coming from your hip, okay? That it's a really nice, long, fluid movement. Think of the movement coming through the hip, down onto the feet, keeping the feet nice and relaxed and smooth. Thank you. Um, we, Jasmine and Iski, are going to come to the stage as well. So if anybody has any questions, I'm sure you probably have plenty after that. That was really good. Thank you. And great tips there by uh, Katrina. That was excellent. Um, okay, so I'll take this down. So have we any hands up tonight? Yes, we have a gentleman here. The health. With your immune system. Yeah, look, first of all, not being an immunologist, uh, I don't have any claims in knowing the science behind it. But from the research and reviews of other studies we've done, I mean, the immune response is huge on a couple of levels. One is that with the cold water immersion, it's, it's almost, because it is a challenging environment, is encouraging this sort of buildup of resilience, you know, even at a physiological level in the body, because the body is having to work harder to reach homeostasis, so that in terms of the temperature shift in the body, so it works as a kind of mini workout. Um, and then it you know, also triggers a whole lot of other immune responses in response to being in what is kind of an unnatural or even uncomfortable environment um, as we're building up a familiarity with it. Um, immune, immunity is also linked to changes in our, um, our blood cells, our red blood cells. Um, yeah, and there's different responses as well in the body depending on which activity we're doing if we're just floating or dipping, if we're long distance swimming, if we're free diving under the water. Um, but it's a huge area, although I see, you know, in terms of the science, we're just scratching the tip of the iceberg. I think also as well, it's good for stress. It helps you be resilient towards stress. Is that true? Absolutely. I mean, uh, the evidence is really strong to support that water environments are the most psychologically restorative of all natural environments for humans. Uh, and of course, because we have that innate connection with water that goes back into our evolutionary biology. Good. Anybody else have any questions? Yes.
Has anybody done a long period jasmine? I don't know, because I am a pretty regular pool swimmer uh, until I moved here, so I, I, I don't yeah, do know. Do you mean the sea, or do you just mean swimming in general? Yeah. All of the sea. Well, yeah, I mean, we didn't have regular access to the sea when I was growing up. Like, I probably visited the ocean once every, like, five years, and I was always delighted by it. I was like, oh, my God. Um, and I actually was very surprised then when I moved to California for graduate or for uh, my undergrad, and I met a bunch of Californians, and I'd be like, oh, like, let's go to the beach. And they're like, oh, we don't really go to the beach. Like, it's okay. And I'm like, I can't believe that you would have this here and not go to it. Like, that doesn't make any sense. So I like the attitude here a lot better. Yeah, I, th I think just thinking about it now, it's a really good question. I think I've made a conscious effort my whole life mm -hmm. to be by the sea. I don't think I could survive without it, to be honest. But I did, for when my, on my first pregnancy, I have a three-year-old and a nine-month-old. Um, I had it was a five week period after pregnancy where I didn't. I was supposed to be six weeks, but I actually couldn't last that long. <laughs> I did dip my feet, but it, I did the first time entering the water after that period. It was, it was a five weeks, and I actually, it was like it was out of body experience because I had been away from it for like I had been close to it, but not immersed in it, which is a totally different thing. And it was like, you know, just the cold, the sensations on my body. It made me really appreciate it even more. And experience it almost like what it was like for someone for the very first time. And it was the cold, really, that really, really gave me back my body, really. So, yeah. Yeah, I think as well, if we're especially getting into the sea, if you get in every day, it's not as daunting. Mm -hmm. If you have that gap and then to get back in, you think, yeah. why haven't I got back in? But once you get it, feel the fear and do it anyway. Yeah, mm -hmm. and breathe. Relax, and breathe. like oh, go flow. <laughs> it's really important if you I, haven't been in a while. To I, I love that, and I also think it's you maybe speaking to the, I think what's the shadow side of this kind of good addiction we have, the pull the sea has in it, if we can't access it, mm -hmm. how do we get our fix? And I know for myself, I sort of three days in and I start to notice the withdrawal symptoms, as I call them, and my dad's a surfer too, so after a week without surfing or not getting into the sea, definitely start to notice kind of side effects. And of course, during, especially during the lockdown, so many people then didn't have access to, to the sea to get their fix. And so actually a lot of work I've been, I've been doing has been the power of connecting with the breath, of recognizing ourselves as bodies of water, um, you know, that beautiful concept or notion that we are ocean, but actually the science behind that is also fascinating. Um, so there's, you know, different ways, uh, not the same, even though as direct immersion, but that there is a way that we carry a piece of it piece of it with us wherever we are and there's ways to tap into that we have a question yes fresh water yeah mm -hmm. that work? have any of you experience of swimming in rivers or lakes yeah yeah, yeah. yeah I mean yeah yeah, for one, from, from an actual physical swimming point of view, obviously you don't have the buoyancy with the salt. Um, there's a lot more to think about. Um, it tastes different. It, it's definitely moving in it very differently, whether you're in a wetsuit or not. Obviously with the wetsuit, it gives you the buoyancy. Um, you know, you have to read the, the currents very, very differently there. You know, what part of the river are you swimming in? What part of the lake are you swimming in? has a huge impact on, on the currents. Um, and then obviously what a lot of people don't realize I suppose is that how the conditions can change really quickly on a lake as well in particular. When you're looking at it, it might look calm from the outset, but it's how the wind moves around certain parts of the lake and off the land. And so yeah, it's, a, it's a whole different um, ball game really when you're dealing with, with that. Yeah, it tastes different, everything's different, yeah. Yeah, I know, it's an excellent question. And in terms of the science behind it, we, we don't yet know. Um, and I think there's a, a whole lot of interesting factors that go into it, and it speaks to what Katrina was saying earlier too. It's not just an understanding of being able to read that particular environment. So my familiarity is the sea. Uh, I go to a river, and uh, there's you know there's certain certain familiarity or pull to that. But then at a lake, it took me a long time to actually get over a fear of swimming in lakes, built on the whole like mythology that we grew up with. It kind of was instilled in me as this you know the dark subconscious. Uh, but you know so that comes into play is noticing how we're feeling in response to that environment. What 
what's our relationship and familiarity like with it also will affect the health uh, outcomes and benefits. But definitely, I think we really underestimate. We talk about the sea and I talk about the ocean. It's really all water, all water bodies, because it's all connected. And if you look at it, I guess I, there's an amazing map of Ireland where it's, you know, we, we kind of think of Ireland as this green island. Uh, but if you actually just look at all the waterways and water bodies, uh, and the network of them, uh, the whole of th this island kind of becomes very blue all of a sudden. Uh, so we're very fortunate in terms of there's so much water around us and then the next part is really caring for what we already have. Yeah, it's so important to protect it and to teach children as well about climate action and the importance of the sea. And I think when they're in swimming in it, they're immersed in it, so they will want to, they have that relationship with it as well. Yeah, I think more. children instinctively know. I think we need to educate a lot more adults as well. <laughs> you know, I think that, yeah, it's, it's, it's well, it, I think I've noticed, you know, and what's really important to me over the last number of years is, is seeing the influx of people, which is amazing. And I, I love to see it. Um, but what I would love to see even more is people giving back to the spaces that they use and from an environmental point of view just protecting what they have i mean it's it gives us so much and we we need to do so much you know to give back to it because we have to keep it safe for for the children but i think adults have a huge responsibility as well any more questions yeah Sorry, Jerry. It depends on the shoreline is the very unsatisfying answer. <laughs> but basically because like because we have the sort of swell towards the moon at any point, it's basically like if the moon is overhead, then you're getting more water on that side of the earth. Um, so you would have tide sort of coming up the shoreline in whatever direction you know it is. Um, but then if you have something like winds that have a direction associated with them, then they could be driving the tides higher or lower depending on their direction. Um, but so the tide is basically, you know, water that's coming up out of the sea, up to the shore, whichever direction the shore goes. Um, but it's that kind of gravitational pull towards the moon. So that's, that's the, the real takeaway is kind of if you can see the moon <laughs> overhead, you can see like what direction water is going to be coming up. But it's coming uphill. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's my takeaway. Water's coming uphill. Um, <laughs> don't look it up. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest takeaway of the night. Yeah. <laughs> That's it, the takeaway. Doesn't get um, that at all. Okay, I think we're good. Um, oh, we have one more question. Okay. Is there a general comment on water quality in the sea in Galway? It varies. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it, again, I mean, you know, we all have a responsibility. I mean, Obviously, where we are in Galway Bay, you have the river flowing out into it as well, which, which changes it and impacts it as well. But, you know, I, I swim every day there. I mean, I feel like it's safe. Sometimes where I don't feel like it's safe, I don't feel like the water quality is good. But I'm not too sure on the, the science or the outside of that. Maybe you'd know better. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's it's mixed. I, 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 the way I like to look at it, and maybe it's the invitation to everyone here, is to uh, how often in our day, everyday lives uh, do we consciously breathe um, <laughs> and think about the breath we're taking in, but also about water. Where Where's your water? Where does it come from? And I'm just building that familiarity and learning as much as you can about your water uh, and then what you can do for it and how is it doing, what's its quality, where's the source, where does it flow to? What other water bodies is it connected to? And I know there is a lot happening actually at a catchment level here in Galway Bay through the likes of Kuan Bio um, and their work. Um, but that, that's, that's where the change happens through that connecting with it in our everyday lives and, and valuing it um, a lot more as this really sacred source of, of life. Very good, thank you. So tomorrow night in Black Rock is the beaver moon, the full moon, and there's a dip at 8.45 if anybody is brave enough to swim under the full moon. Thank you, Katrina Lynch, East Key Britain, and Jessamine Fairfield. Thank you.